Ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Gus O'Donnell. I have the privilege of being the president of the IFS. I'm delighted to have you all here tonight. You are not here to listen to me. You are here, and it is my enormous pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor David Orter. Uh, this is a moment when the UK is embarking on a journey out of the EU and contemplating trade deals with other countries. I think we need to be paying particular attention to Professor Orta, probably the best qualified person in the world to discuss the impact of trade on labour markets and wages. Someone who takes that breadth of experience across a number of different fields, applies it with empirical data to actually come up with really useful policy prescriptions and analyses, which if I were in my old job, which thank God I'm not, I would be <laughs> relying on him. Tonight, he's going to focus on the economic and political, co political consequences of China's rise for the United States, lessons from the China shock. Uh, and much of uh, Professor Orta's recent research has focused on the impact of technological change and globalization on inequality. And, and you'll know many commentators are asserting that such factors explain political developments from Professor, uh, President Trump's election to our own Brexit decision. So tonight's lecture could not be more timely. Professor Orta is the full Professor of Economics at MIT and Associate Head of their departments. He's also worked in the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Poverty Action Lab, and the German Institute of the Study of Labour, known as IZA. He's also edited many economics journals, including Journal of Economics Perspectives, the JEL, RE Stats, and finally, he's co-director of the MIT School's Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative, which is a research program focusing on the economics of education and the relationship between human capital and income distribution. And he's associate director of the MBER's Disability Research Center. What an incredible list. I mean, when you think about why their productivity is a little bit higher than ours, now you know, right? So we are incredibly grateful that he's found time in such a busy schedule to talk with us tonight, please welcome Professor David Orta. Thank you very much for... <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction. It is an honor to be here. Uh, I hope I can uh, make some remarks that will be relevant to, to your own thinking, both about trade and about uh, policy. And uh, I should say that this work represents a kind of a research program that I've uh, done, embarked on jointly with uh, David Dorn of the University of Zurich, uh, Gordon Hansen of UC San Diego, Daron Esamoglu of MIT, uh, and some of my students as well, including Brendan Price of MIT. Uh, so many people should deserve the blame uh, for what's about to happen to you. Uh, the, uh, and what I want to talk about is uh, what we have learned uh, in the last uh, from the last 20 years of trade experience in the United States, and particularly the last 15 years, uh, following China's uh, monumental rise as a world trading power, power, and how it's helped us to better understand the uh, economic and social consequences of uh, rapid globalization uh, when it's uh, particularly in a kind of a north-south context. And uh, what I'm going to say, it does not overturn uh, our understanding, in fact, is consistent with canonical theory, but it really places emphasis uh, in different locations, uh, different aspects than uh, I think uh, uh, previous work had uh, supported. So let me get going, and I look forward to your questions at the end of the talk as well. So this shows you uh, China's historic rise as a world manufacturing power, uh, where it went from making essentially 0% of the world's uh, manufacturing exports to almost 20% uh, in the course of a little more than 20 years, 25 years approximately. And that is a monumental achievement. Um, what's surprising, by the way, is not that China accounts for 20% of world uh, manufacturing now. It's that it was so backward. Uh, 25 years ago, accounting for almost zero, which is remarkable for a country, the world's uh, most populous country and a pretty well-educated country at that. And it's incredible forward march uh, from uh, economic backwardness to uh, economic leadership uh, is, uh, is uh, remarkable. It's like nothing we've ever seen uh, on this scale in a country so large. And uh, that really reflects uh, internal developments within China. Really, uh, it was Deng Xiaoping's work, uh, who had various roles throughout his life, including some time uh, uh, in prison, uh, and eventually became the chairman of the National Committee of the Chinese Pe People's Political Consultative Conference, 
And uh, his big uh, idea was uh, of reforming and opening the Chinese economy starting in the late 1970s. And what that meant was a number of things, allowing foreign direct investment, uh, allowing, uh, Western, allowing prices to be used to allocate resources, allowing labor mobility. Uh, over the course of 20 years, about a quarter of a million uh, Chinese migrated out of relatively unproductive agricultural work into export processing zones, into cities uh, to, uh, to produce. And that was a remarkable reallocation of, of human labor. Uh, and to allow the, the adaptation and of, of uh, Western technologies, uh, the use of prices, as I said. And that resulted in an incredible period of productivity growth. Uh, and uh, this map just shows you uh, Chinese spe special economic zones uh, clustered along uh, the south near Hong Kong, uh, where a lot of this export processing took place. So China first integrated with Hong Kong and then integrated with uh, the rest of the world. And that is a remarkable achievement. Before we talk about any other consequences, it's, it's, it's crucial to recognize that uh, China's uh, rise over the last 20 years is probably one of the sort of great economic uh, good fortunes, happenings uh, of you know, maybe a millennium. Uh, this brought 400 million Chinese out of poverty, but the, ben but the benefits were not limited to China. Uh, it created a commodity boom that raised prosperity through Central and South America. China has made investments in Sub-Saharan Africa in places where the West uh, doesn't tend to venture. Uh, there have been enormous benefits uh, in terms of actually you know, increasing the size of the global middle class and uh, reducing world inequality. So before I talk about any adverse consequences or adjustment costs, I just want to put this in this context of saying overall this is a world historical uh, positive event, something we should welcome. Um, but it has had uh, uh, mostly positive consequences, but also had created some challenges. So uh, uh, many of you will be aware, you know, the, the case for free trade, why integration uh, between countries is a good thing, uh, goes back to David Ricardo, uh, Portuguese economist, uh, who said trade uh, allows, <laughs> is that incorrect? OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, trade allows countries to specialize in the goods uh, which they're most productive, the comparative advantage. So a uh, simple way to say this is that free trade among consenting nations should raise GDP in all of them. Uh, all countries can become wealthier by doing what they do best, uh, exporting that, and uh, importing the things that they're not as good at. They specialize in what they do well. Here's the rub said by Drew Barrymore in 1922, not Portuguese, uh, is uh, what's good for countries as a whole is not necessarily good for, the ci for all citizens of a country. Trade creates, normally creates winners and losers. And in general, trade will have diffuse benefits, lowering prices, increasing variety, uh, shared by most consumers as well as many producers, and it will often have concentrated costs costs on the individuals employed in the sectors that now face more strenuous competition from abroad. This is, Ricardo understood this. Uh, it was formalized by uh, Paul Samuelson uh, in the 1940s um, that, there are bene that there are winners and losers. Why is free trade then not a free lunch? Why doesn't everyone benefit from having lower prices and greater variety? Well, a few reasons. One is that trade necessitates reallocation of workers and jobs. Uh, workers are going to be displaced from career jobs typically when, they, when the sector or the industry they're in faces a more striving competition. That may require new locations, new skills, new occupations. It often leaves uh, economic as well as psychological scars. We've known for a long time as labor economists that people who are displaced involuntarily from stable career jobs often experience sustained earnings losses on the order of 10 or 20 or 30 percent of annual earnings over the course of 5, 10, 15 years. So one is it's going to be disruptive. A second point is that trade permanently alters skill demands. Uh, it, uh, by lowering the prices of some goods and raising the prices of others, it will tend to raise the wages of people who have the skills used for the goods that become more valuable, and it will tend to lower the wages of the skills of people who make the goods that become less valuable. Or in economic parlance, goods price, uh, sorry, factors prices, excuse me, goods prices, <laughs> sorry, in economic confusion, uh, goods prices feed through to factors prices. Prices of products feed through to the, to the to wages of workers. And so it's quite possible that even as trade grows the economic pie, 
by a few percentage points, it could shrink some slices in absolute magnitude by a much larger extent. There's nothing inconsistent about saying that trade raises national GDP uh, by 2% and makes some workers 30% poorer. Um, and, uh, and, so it, and it does that through changing the wage rates. That's the good scenario. Uh, the bad scenario uh, is that there's additional frictional adjustment costs on top of those equilibrium effects on wages. In particular, in the textbook scenario, displaced workers, they lose jobs in an import competing sector, they lose, they lose jobs in, uh, in uh, wine making and move into cloth making, uh, in Ricardo's example. Uh, so they're immediately reabsorbed from one sector to another. Uh, new businesses will open, which, which will take advantage of the economic slack created by destruction of previous enterprises. Uh, new jobs that are created will be about as good as the old ones. And these concentrated impacts of you know, the places that lose a textile plant or lose a leather plant or lose a furniture plant, um, uh, those will dis diffuse nationally. So there'll be a small decline in aggregate demand for production workers as trade grows, but there won't be any, a local crater where manufacturing used to stand. That's the good scenario. The bad scenario uh, is if workers are not geographically mobile, uh, if they have challenges acquiring new skills, if firms don't enter declining areas to pick up the slack, uh, if public benefits kind of induce workers to withdraw from the labor market rather than taking new jobs, then the economic costs will fall much more heavily on a few. So we know there's going to be costs, but the question is how, who bears them? How concentrated are they, or how much are they uh, a kind of a blip on the surface of a very large pond? Let me give this to you very concretely. So this is the case of textile employment in the United States between 1990 and 2017. You can see that between 1994 and 2017, uh, about three quarters of all employment in textiles uh, uh, went away. And most of it happened in kind of an eight year period. Some of it having to do with China's joining the World Trade Organization in 2001. Some of it having to do with the end of the so-called multi-fiber agreement in 2004. And so uh, we now have many fewer textile workers than we used to have. Is that a big deal or is it a little deal? Well, 400,000 workers in a labor market of 150 million people, that's a very small number, right? You can't even, that doesn't even register on the Richter scale. However, those 400,000 workers are not dispersed across the entire United States. Uh, textile and apparel, 50% of all those jobs were concentrated uh, in eight states. In 57 counties, more than 15% of all jobs was in textiles and apparel. Um, these are mostly southeastern, non-metropolitan counties. These are the highest poverty areas of the United States. In those counties, 25% of workers are high, are high school dropouts. So when textile employment goes away, those individuals are not going to quickly re find re-employment. That's going to be a very concentrated impact. So even though 400,000 jobs is minute relative to the scale of the US labor market, for the areas that were concentrated in textile, that's like a mini economic bomb going off over sort of downtown. So what, we wanna, what I want to talk about now is looking at this at a, in the macrocosm, um, learning from the labor market adjustment to the seism seismic trades changes in international trade. And I want to ask, what do we learn from studying the China shock about whether workers quickly find reemployment, whether new businesses quickly pick up the slack, whether the new jobs are about as good as the old jobs. And uh, in the, I might take a few minutes at the end. There are two topics that I could talk about. I probably only talk about one of them, which is how, what have been the political repercussions of these same economic forces. So let me just give you uh, an overview here. In, uh, this figure shows you China's imports as a function of all US goods consumption, which goes from basically under a quarter of a percentage points in 1987 to about a half a percentage point, uh, sorry, excuse me, to about five percentage points uh, in uh, 2007. So it's a 20-fold increase at least, maybe a little, little more. Um, the red uh, dash series gives you US manufacturing employment as a share of working age adults. And you can see it's, uh, it's at around 12%, 13%, and then it starts falling in the late 90s, around 2000, and it really kind of, that fall accelerates in 2001. What happened in 2001? China joined the World Trade Organization, and its exports surged, particularly to the United States. Now, you may look at that and say, how big a deal is that really? I mean, we know, you all know, that manufacturing employment has been in decline since the end of World War II, and this figure reinforces that view. Uh, in 1943, 39% of all U.S. employment was in manufacturing. 
uh, by 2014, that was 8.6%. If I said, where is China's accession to the WTO in this figure, you would be hard pressed to find it. Right? You don't even see that 2001 blip. So let me show you the same figure, but I'm, not, I'm going to remove the denominator. I'm not going to divide by working age population. I'll just show you the count of manufacturing jobs. So this shows you that in 1943, there were 16.6 million US manufacturing workers. That was the high point as a fraction of employment. By 1979, that was actually up to 20 million. By 1999, it had fallen modestly to 7.3 million, 17.3 million, excuse me. Then between 1999 and 2007, it fell by uh, four and a half million, uh, excuse me, three and a half million workers, uh, which is 20%. And then cumulatively to 2016, it fell by 32%. So a one third reduction in the total number of manufacturing workers. So that actually is quite an unprecedented fall. And so when you denominate by overall employment, it doesn't look that big, but you can see previously, most of the decline in manufacturing employment was occurring some, to some extent through attrition. Right? The number of workers was hold, holding relatively steady. People would come in, they would leave. It wasn't really contracting in terms of jobs, per se. In this short period, we saw this enormous fall. And so that is unusual. And it does mean, uh, and it, it does mean that a lot of adjustment is going to have to take place. Many millions of people are going to have to find new work. And so the question is, did they do that quickly? Did they do that slowly? Did they find about equally good jobs or not equally good jobs? Did they actually reenter? Did they reintegrate into the labor market or did they exit the labor market? Did employers pour in or did things just kind of sit there? That's what we would like to explore. Um, and uh, so let me give you some evidence on that. So the first question is, do workers quickly find reemployment? So let me just describe very briefly how we do this. Just uh, uh, so what this this analysis, which is with David Dorn, Gordon Hansen, and Jay Song of Social Security Administration, uh, looks at workers uh, at individual worker wage records from U.S. Uh, administrative data, and looks at people according to their industry of employment uh, in uh, 1989 to 1991. So we identify people working in manufacturing, but not just manufacturing. We identify what industry their manufacturing plant is in. So is it textiles? Is it leathers? Is it aircraft engines? Is it auto parts, etc. And that's really important because. Not all of manufacturing was equally affected by China's rise. China had comparative advantage in labor-intensive manufacturing, right? things that required a lot of hand assembly. So that would be working with soft materials, like leathers and textiles. That would be working with wood, like making commodity furniture, where you actually have to sand and urethane. It would be assembling things, like iPhones or even toys. And so, so this is not high-tech manufacturing. This is not the type of manufacturing that's actually automating very quickly. This is kind of the trailing edge of manufacturing that continues to require large amounts of labor input. Um, so we look at those sectors, and we see China's rise in each of those industries. And we don't actually just use the rise in the US. We use China's simultaneous rise of import penetration in each of those industries occurring across uh, seven other rich countries simultaneously. And we look at the common component. If we see all these countries start to import their tennis sneakers from China, start to import their commodity furniture from China, we infer that China's prices are falling, its productivity is rising, the trade costs are declining. So this is the part that's coming from the supply push, the part that's coming from China's sort of galloping march uh, of comparative advantage, rising productivity, uh, lowering trade costs. And we, and we say we're workers who were employed in those sectors that were going to become exposed to Chinese imports, what happened to them? What happened to their job change? What happened to their earnings, et cetera? So this first figure shows you excess job changes. So the number of additional job changes that people make as a function of exposure over the next, uh, uh, let's say, 15 years. And this is relative to workers in non-exposed sectors. So what this figure shows is that uh, over the next 15 years, people who were in working at firms that became directly subject to Chinese import com competition, making about an additional two job changes, right? Or that could be job to job, job to non-employment, et cetera. Those whiskers are the standard errors, right? If they don't cross the zero, that means they're statistically distinguishable from zero. Uh, they, they're significant, in other words. Um, so is that a big deal or a small deal? Well, kind of depends where they end up, right? What are they transitioning to? Uh, so this next figure does the same for annual income. And this shows you the cumulative loss in annual income uh, relative to base earnings over the next 15 years. So cumulatively, they lose about 45% of a year's income. income. Over 15 years, that's not such a big deal, right? That's a few percentage points a year. So they do seem to lose income, 
but it's not an enormous amount. However, if you were to look at the bottom third of workers, the people who are at the bottom third of the uh, earnings ladder, their losses are much larger. If you look at the top third, their losses are almost zero. So as, as in so many things in the labor market, the people who tend to bear the biggest costs are the people who are less well off initially. They're the people who are less adaptive, their skills are less valuable, they face weaker outside options. Now you look at this figure and you ask yourself, wait a minute, this seems to get bigger and bigger over time. Why, if the initial impact was in you know, 1990, why did the effects actually start to get larger after 2001? Shouldn't these people be out of harm's way uh, by uh, you know, 10 years later? So this figure helps to answer that question. Um, this uh, uh, blue line, the, the upper series, shows you the correlation between their trade exposure at their initial job and their trade exposure in subsequent jobs or subsequent years. And so by construction, that's equal to one in the first period, right? They are as exposed initially as they are exposed initially. And then it declines so that after 17 years, uh, that has, the correlation has fallen to about uh, 60%, 50%. Now, the lower line shows you a counterfactual scenario where as soon as, everyone, as soon as someone lost their first job or left their first job, they moved to a non-exposed sector, sector. They moved into services. They moved into mining or something. The fall would be twice as great in their exposure if that had occurred. What that says is that people do a lot of job changing, but they're changing into jobs that continue to face the same adverse effects, right? They move from one part of manufacturing to another. So they're really not getting out of harm's way very quickly. So the reason that your initial exposure seems to predict a big wage loss after 2001 is because although people have changed jobs more often, they've continued to move in the areas where they're repeatedly shocked, where they're repeatedly hit. So it's not a one-time adjustment, in other words. It's kind of a slow-moving crisis for many workers. OK, so the next question you want to ask is, OK, well, those are the workers who were initially employed at trade-impacted uh, uh, plants. But let's ask now geographically, what happens in the areas where a lot of trade is going on? Now, something really important to understand about manufacturing, and I'm sure this is intuitive, is it's not like drugstores, grocery bagging clerks, doctor's offices, and so on. It's very geographically concentrated. You will not find it in most places. Most, you know, the most cities do very little manufacturing, and in some places, that's their main line of business. And not only is manufacturing their main line of business, but it's usually a specific type of manufacturing. So in the United States, if you're talking about you know, uh, commodity furniture, you're talking about Tennessee. If you're talking about textiles, you're talking about the Carolinas. Right? So manufacturing, where it occurs, it occurs in a very concentrated way. Most of the firms doing the work are all in the same place. This is the, you know, what we call agglomeration. Um, so when we ask about the impact of a trade shock, it's not going to be evenly distributed across space. It's going to be very concentrated in some locations. And so it's possible that that would affect not just the directly impacted uh, firms, but the, the businesses around them as well. Could affect them in two ways. One way is they could say, oh, look, real estate prices are coming down, workers are available, and they could flood in. Another possibility is they could say, hmm, consumer buying power is falling. There isn't that dem much demand for support services. Maybe this is not a very good place to do business. Empirical question. This figure shows you the geographic concentration of trade exposure. So the darker red areas are the areas that have greater, or have greater uh, employment initially in the labor intensive industries that become highly exposed to China trade, where China's trade, trade comparative advantage and rise quickly. So you can see like the top products are furnitures and fixtures, games, toys, and vehicles, sporting and athletic goods, electronic components, plastic products, et cetera. And so a lot of this, I'll just point out walking across the screen, a lot of this is in the South and South Atlantic, some along the Northeast of the United States. So these, as many of you will know, are relatively low educated areas in the US. They're low wage areas. They're non-unionized areas. That's an important reason why a lot of manufacturing goes on in these areas. You know, Southern United States was, was the US's version of China before China. Um, so now we can ask, well, what happens to overall employment in these locations uh, following these trade shocks? So we can look um, both between 1990 and 2000 and 2000 and 2007. This is the effect on manufacturing employment. So let me just say every $1,000 increase in trade exposure measured in thousands of dollars per worker um, appears to reduce manufacturing employment by about three quarters of a percentage point, let's say. That's a pretty big number. It's not enormous. Initially, the level was about 12%. At one level, that's not surprising. 
right? We know that we're importing lots of labor-intensive goods that we used to be producing domestically, so clearly manufacturing employment is going to fall in those locations. The question is, what happens next? Where do those workers go? So this figure answers that question in a very simple way. The, the uh, first bar is the decline in manufacturing employment. The second bar is the decline in non-manufacturing employment in the same location. The third bar is the rise in unemployment, in other words, people who say, I'm out of work, but I'm looking for a job. And the fourth bar is the fraction of people who are out of the work and not looking for a job. They say, I'm out of labor force. Those have to sum to zero. So what we find, rather surprisingly and distressingly, is at least over a 10-year interval, not only is there not a rebound of other employment, but there's actually a slight knock-on effect in non-manufacturing. So for every you know, uh, six-tenths of a percentage point decline we see in manufacturing, we see another two-tenths of a percentage point decline in non-manufacturing. So over a 10-year interval, we do not see these areas actually experience an employment rebound. Now, you might say, well, what about the more educated versus the less educated? And there you see an interesting story. So this shows you the same uh, figure broken down for college-educated and non-college-educated workers. Ooh, I have a little pointer. So for college-educated workers, what you see is the decline in manufacturing employment is partly uh, offset by an increase in employment outside of non-manufacturing. In fact, that's statistically significant. So we see college-educated workers reallocating. We also see some of them unemployed and some of them exiting the labor force. For non-college workers, people who have high school or below, the loss in manufacturing is paralleled by a loss in non-manufacturing. Why? Well, there's some contraction of the sector because it's supp providing support to manufacturing, and college workers are flooding in. Right? So who would you hire? Right? So they appear to outcompete non-college workers for these positions. So the end result is their rise in non-participation unemployment is actually substantially larger than their fall in manufacturing employment. The fall in manufacturing is 0.6, the rise in unemployment and non-participation is 1.1%. So that's actually a really uh, uh, big and not very favorable change. And I say, well, what are they doing? What's, you know, what if they're not working? Uh, well, one thing they are doing is they're receiving uh, public transfer benefits. Uh, so this figure shows you the effect of a $1,000 shock, $1,000 meaning a, a $1,000 uh, per, per, work, per, uh, per worker, on payment to public transfer benefits. So the total that this comes to is about $60 per thousand. About $4 of that is coming from unemployment and trade adjustment assistance. Those are our two programs designed for displaced workers. Unemployment insurance is the standard thing. Trade adjustment is a kind of an add-on to unemployment insurance. And that responds, in fact, that's an extremely elastic response. The base of that, that number is very small, so that's like a 15-fold increase. It's huge in, that, in proportional terms, but it's minute in dollar terms. The next effect is disability. Those are people who are taking basically a permanent early retirement uh, for health-related reasons, although uh, they were previously working, many of them. A third is early retirement itself, so people who are over, 65, over 62. Uh, a fourth is other government assistance programs, so food stamps, uh, temporary assistance for needy family, and so on. And the fifth is medical benefits. So it turns out that although we have two labor market programs that in theory are targeted on people who lose jobs involuntarily, most of the transfer payments are coming from, oops, excuse me, non-labor market programs. They're coming from the social safety net. Now, on the one hand, that's good news, right? The social safety net, that's what it's there for, to catch people. On the other hand, the, the incentive properties of that social safety net are poor. The disability system is a one-way ticket out of the labor market. So uh, I don't want to imply that the social safety net is the reason people are leaving the labor force. I, don't not, I do not think that's true. Uh, I think most people, especially in the case of disability, turn to it when they run out of other options, and they would much rather be working, and they, wouldn't have, and they certainly would not have preferred to lose their jobs in the first place. However, it does suggest that uh, these programs will be sticky. Once people go on, they will tend to stay on, and it does make it feasible for them uh, to uh, continue in that mode. Okay, so the next question I want to ask is, well, what about the, the jobs that are created, or, or the alternative jobs that people go to? How do they compare? Uh, to the ones that are lost. Well, uh, here I'm going to be, this is a, a slightly uh, a subtle question to answer, but I want to start with this question about, you know, manufacturing employment, uh, how much should we care about it per se? And there's a, a kind of a, you know, economists uh, have famously belittled uh, the public fascination uh, with manufacturing employment. Uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, a trade economist at Columbia, uh, call, called it uh, manufacturing fetishism, the idea that somehow manufacturing jobs are kind of more special uh, than other jobs. Uh, 
And uh, I always thought that was pretty clever. I still do. I also used to think it was correct, um, uh, his criticism. I no longer think that. So I want to make the case that manufacturing jobs actually are a bit different. So uh, this figure shows you, this is just cross-sectional data from the year 2000. Uh, this is the share of young adults. I'm focusing on people 18 to 39 right now. Uh, so not people who are nearing retirement at, at any reasonable speed. <laughs> uh, and uh, this, the, the x-axis is the share of population, 18 to 39, that were employed in manufacturing in 2000. The y-axis is the gap in annual earnings between men and women. So what this says, without casting any judgment or saying that this is a good thing or a bad thing, is that places that had more manufacturing, men were earning relatively high wages relative to women. That's a combination of relatively high hourly earnings, relatively high hours, and maybe women aren't working specifically because men are working. And so low educated men making relatively good uh, incomes. This figure shows you if you did the same plot for the fraction employed in non-manufacturing or the fraction not employed, you would not see the same thing. Right? So manufacturing, places with a lot of manufacturing are places where men are earning relatively high earnings and that is probably the basis of a kind of a family arrangement. In fact, you can see that in this figure. Um, this shows you the same population employed in manufacturing. This shows you the share of women ages 18 to 39 who are currently married. So places where there's manufacturing, uh, men are earning more than women, uh, young men, women and men are more likely to be married. Now again, I'm not extolling the virtues of that life per se. I'm not criticizing it either. Uh, I simply, uh, what I want to point out is that, it, it, that manufacturing is, support, is serving as the economic foundation of a set of social arrangements. And it doesn't have close substitutes, so it's likely when that economic foundation is undercut that it will have disruptive effects on social organization. And you may say, well, why is it? Why did manufacturing workers appear to earn, you know, why does this look so good? So in, in the, uh, the cross-sectional data, if you just look at men and women employed in manufacturing relative to adults not employed in manufacturing in the very same locations with comparable education and potential experience, you find that people in manufacturing are making 20% more a year about. Surprisingly, uh, about two-thirds of that is actually coming from longer hours. They work more stable employment. They work in shifts and they work full-time and they're not called in, you know, every other Sunday or the morning shift between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m., they're working long, stable hours. So two-thirds of the difference is coming from hours, only one-third from higher wages. Um, so it's a type of job that doesn't appear very likely to have close substitutes. When people leave manufacturing, in which they have a specialized set of skills that's used in concert with machinery that works on a regularized clock, many will move into service employment where hours tend to be much less stable, where workers are much more interchangeable, and so it's unlikely that they will get the s same level of earnings and stability. So, uh, the, uh, so to ask, well, what does this shock to manufacturing do to the relationship between men's and women's earnings and their overall family relationships, we did an analysis. This is another recent paper by, uh, with David Dorn and, uh, and uh, Gordon Hansen. So we look at the impact of a trade shock. I'm going to call a one-unit trade shock is basically one standard deviation, so covering about two-thirds of the distribution, on the earnings of men relative to women, the annual earnings. So what you can see is uh, this is, and this plots them initially at the, at the 75th percentile of distribution, i.e. three-quarters of the way up, at the median, and at the bottom. So at all three locations, shocks to manufacturing lower men's wages relative to women's, or annual earnings. You say about 700 here, about 600 here, about 1,300 here. So uh, it's definitely reducing men's relative to women's earnings. Let me show you this in a, in a, uh, in a more, uh, I think, dramatic way. I'm going to show these changes relative to initial male earnings at those percentiles. So that's that figure. So you can see that at the top of the distribution, from basically uh, from the very top down to about the 60th percentile, almost nothing. The losses are so small relative to high base levels of earnings that it kind of isn't really having a measurable effect. Then as we move to the 40th percentile, that comes in about a 5% loss, and then uh, to, the, to the 30th and then to the 20th, and pretty soon we're down to about a 30% loss in relative earnings of uh, men at the bottom relative to women at the bottom distribution. So what this says is uh, these shocks are kind of compressing the, their, you know, I should be clear, men's earnings are above women's earnings at every point of the distribution. So it's not saying that men are making less than women. Uh, it's saying that men are making relatively less 
uh, as compared to women they used to be. Again, no judgment involved. Uh, not, uh, uh, it simply suggests that this is going to make it tougher for less educated men to be uh, viable economic partners. Right? It makes them, uh, in, in, uh, crude, in crude economic terms, uh, it lowers their marriage market value. Um, so uh, the, uh, we, uh, in, the, in the work on this paper, we ask about some of the consequences that this has uh, for func the, the kind of function of adults. And again, I want to be emphasize, I'm focusing only on people here 18 to 39. And the reason I'm doing that is because often when you think about decline manufacturing, you sort of imagine these sunset industries where, you know, people in their late 50s who've been doing the same thing for 30 years or, you know, leaving the labor market and going for an early retirement. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually uh, relatively young adults. Uh, where there's manufacturing around, they do a fair amount of it. One thing we look at is consequences for mortality. I'm sure many of you ha are familiar with the very now known work by uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton showing how the kind of opioid epidemic has shortened lives of uh, young and middle-aged Americans, uh, many of them white, non-Hispanic. Um, so we asked whether do we see a change in mortality in areas impacted by these same trade shocks. So this shows you uh, the estimated impacts on shocks, these are of, on deaths per 100,000 adults for drug and alcohol poisoning, liver disease, diabetes, lung cancer, and suicide. The thing that jumps out at you is there's an enormous increase in drug and alcohol poisoning related deaths among men in these locations. There's a small increase in liver disease, not significant, uh, a, a slight increase in diabetes that would you know, normally be associated with uh, unhealthy behaviors, and then a significantly, statistically significant increase in suicide among women. Now, how should you think about these? These are actually small numbers. So among men, 18 to 39, the annual mortality rate per 100,000 is about 280. So an increase of 11 deaths on a base of 280 is not a large number, but it's epidemic relative to drug and alcohol poisoning. And more importantly, I would say even, for every person who dies of drug and alcohol poisoning, presumably a lot more people come close or uh, partake more than would be healthy. Uh, and so I think this is emblematic of a greater level of dysfunction. So the people I'm, I'm less concerned about the people who, who have already passed away, uh, I'm, uh, it's the people who are very much at risk uh, that I'm worried about. Um, so this is emblematic of one form of, uh, uh, of, of dysfunction. Uh, another factor we want to look at is uh, children's living circumstances. And the reason to care about that is, uh, you might say to yourself, I think it's a piece of reason, look, there's not much we can do. People have lost work. It's very hard for adults to retrain. Uh, you know, that's a generational thing, but their kids will be fine. You know, that's the American way. And there's something to that. Um, but it is uh, surprisingly clear that uh, the, um, these shocks also feed through into household living circumstances. So this asks, asks about the effect of a one-unit trade shock on the fraction of children under 18 living in poverty. It rises by an astonishing two percentage points. That's on a base of about 20%. So that's a quite a steep increase in poverty. It occurs among married households, among single-headed households, and to a lesser extent among grandparent-headed households and uh, institutional households. Part of that is coming from uh, a shuffling of kids into single-headed households, which tend to be poor. There's a decline in marriage rates. Uh, but part of it is coming from uh, uh, a f a just a fall in earnings of all household types. So one concern that I have in looking at this is we see these employment declines. Uh, we, don't, we see people not bouncing back quickly. We see a bunch of dis evidence of dysfunction among young adults. And then we see children uh, growing up in more adverse circumstances, which raises the, you know, the bar for them, makes it harder for them to succeed as an adult, succeed as adults. Okay, so uh, I think that that kind of demographic backdrop of the sort of changes in behavior sort of sets the stage for asking about the political consequences. Uh, because you can see, uh, it, once you know, you say, well, people lost work, they didn't quickly find work, we see other signs of dysfunction going on around them, and you especially would expect to see a bunch of really irritable males, right? men whose uh, you know, position in the world has been brought down, in some cases, by 30% if you measure position by income, which economists will tend to do, though the rest of you shouldn't. Um, the, uh, so we want to ask, well, how has this affected uh, US uh, expressive uh, voting behavior? So one thing to know about the US is that the US has been politically polarizing 
for some time. So if you, looked at, if you look at data from the House of Representatives, from the Senate, the parties have been splitting apart for quite a long while. In fact, after 2002, according to measures of uh, political ideology based on votes, the most conservative Democrat uh, is more liberal than the most liberal Republican. There's no overlap in the distributions any longer, which is remarkable. That wasn't as true of the electorate until recently. This figure from the, the uh, Pew uh, Research Center just shows you the fraction of Republicans who are to the median of, or to the right of the median Democrat, more conservative. So if they were, uh, if they were, the distributions were comparable, would that be 50%? You see it goes from 64% to 92% in 2014. And similarly for Republicans, 70% of Democrats were to the left of the median Republican. That was 94% by 2014. So really a pretty big divergence. You also see this on expressions of uh, beliefs about, uh, uh, about many social issues. So for example, this shows you uh, Republican and, and Democratic responses to the question of poor people today have it easy because they can get government benefits without doing anything in return. We can see among Democrats, that's kind of uh, balancing around around 25%. Among Republicans, that was as low as 50% and as high as 66. Similarly, immigrants today are a burden in our country. Most corporations make a fair and reasonable amount of profit. Stricter environmental laws and regulations cost too many jobs and hurt the economy. And you can see the parties, the, the people who vote for these parties pulling apart. And what's actually equally interesting is the clustering of those views has become tighter. So it used to be that if I asked you your views on, you know, should we clean up the environment? That wasn't that predictive of your views on what tax rates should be, what immigration should be, what welfare benefits should be. But now people's views much more cluster along these uh, party polls. I don't even want to call them ideological polls because I'm not sure there's a coherent ideology that links those beliefs. But as an expressive matter, uh, they go together. Um, so, uh, so we in uh, work with uh, David Dorn and Kav, uh, Gordon Hansen, Kaveh Majlesi of uh, Lund University in Stockholm. Uh, we said, well, can we see if these trade shocks have contributed to political polarization. So to do that, uh, we needed to sort of put together the US electoral map. And the US electoral map is a very funny thing. Uh, so this shows you the voting district of uh, North Carolina District 12 called the most gerrymandered district uh, in America. You can see it's about 100 miles long and about an inch wide. So uh, representative. Uh, uh, Mickey Michaud, who's a member of North Carolina the House of Representatives, said, if you drove down the interstate with both door, door, car doors open, you'd kill most of the people in my district. Uh, uh, that's it. Now, as you probably heard, or, or, uh, just last week, the Supreme Court uh, is, agreed it's going to hear a case on gerrymandering. This is actually one of the greatest perversions of, of U.S. democracy, and there are many perverse things. Uh, so uh, it, will be, it, will be quite, it will be quite remarkable if they actually uh, change how that's done. But so what our uh, analysis does uh, is uh, it links trade shocks at the commuting zone level, which are clusters of counties, uh, down to the county level, which comprise commuting zones, down to the district, voting district, basically taking sub-districts of voting districts and showing where they overlap with counties. And so basically it's a way of projecting this economic geography into the political geography of the United States, and then asking in areas that are differentially exposed, do you see any change in voting behavior? And in particular, we look at the effects first, or first, the first part of the project looks at the US House of Representatives. Uh, the House of Representatives, you know, there's elections every two years, uh, there's a lot of them, so you can learn a lot because it's high frequency data. And we group candidates into five categories, uh, uh, moderate, lib moderate Democrat, moderate conservative, uh, 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 high, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, strong li left, strong liberal, and strongly conservative. And um, I guess that's four categories. <laughs> and we do that on the basis not of, of, uh, of uh, newspaper clippings, but on the basis of their, voting, of their voting behavior once elected. So once in office, they reveal their ideology by the set of votes that they make. There's a well-developed political science literature that kind of traces out how to do this. And we ask, what happens in districts that are differentially shocked? How does that move the, the ideology of candidates? And notice. That can move the ideology of candidates either by causing people to change their voting behavior or by causing candidates to be replaced. And not necessarily by replaced by people of, the, of a different party. They could just be replaced by someone who's more extreme of the same party. So this graphic summarizes it. This is a graphic that the New York Times did uh, based on this paper. Uh, and they said they took the conceptual experiment. What if we rolled back trade by 50%? So just 
took half the trade shock and pretended it didn't happen, imagine everything else stayed the same, which is, of course, a big leap of imagination. What would the House of Representatives look like? Well, of 430 representatives, we estimate that there would be 16 more moderate Democrats, six more moderate Republicans, 18 fewer conservative Republicans, and four fewer liberal Democrats. That's a big polarization. Now, you might say, well, what's going on? Uh, I can understand why they're taking out moderates, but why both liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans? Well, it's interesting, actually. Um, if you look at the voting districts that are majority white non-Hispanic, uh, when they're exposed to trade shocks, they uniformly kick out the moderates and vote in Republicans. If you look at the voting districts that are the complement, uh, majority minority, um, they do the opposite. They vote in liberal Democrats. Now you'd say, well, then why are those so unbalanced? Well, uh, the percentage of US voting districts that are majority white, non-Hispanic, is 84%, uh, which of course is not the share of the population that's majority non-white Hispanic, which is like, you know, something like 45%. Uh, so that goes back to that diagram of Mickey Michaud and the, the very thin district. Uh, that's the nature of gerrymandering in the United States that uh, packs minorities into such a small number of districts. So, uh, so we estimate uh, that, that this um, trade talk actually really did contribute to the polarization of the House of Representatives. Now, funnily enough, we still did not use that to forecast the Trump victory. We should have, you know, if we were taking our research seriously enough, we should have said, well, look, this is a kind of microcosm of what's happening in 2016. You know, shouldn't you think this is going to cause uh, some type of ideological change in the presidency? And we just sort of waited until it was over and stood on the sideline. Um, but in fact, uh, that's what we find. So this figure uh, from the Wall Street Journal, based on the same paper, uh, we look at uh, counties. Counties are the, the voting unit uh, in US elections. And uh, we ask, again, if you were to roll back the trade shock, how would that have affected the Trump versus Clinton vote? And uh, it is, uh, as many of you are aware, many districts that were relatively Democrat-leaning uh, voted for Trump. And it turns out that that was particularly pronounced in areas that were trade impacted. Now, that might or might not have mattered. It depended where those er what those areas were and how close they were to the margin, how close they were to 50%. Turns out, in Georgia or Arizona, if you roll back the trade chalk 100%, wouldn't have made any difference. In New Hampshire or Minnesota, it wouldn't have made any difference because they were already going to vote for Trump. Uh, the, excuse me, they were, gonna, they were gonna vote for uh, Clinton anyway. However, the three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, where we estimate a reduction of, uh, a reduction of the trade shock of 30% would have caused those states to swing the other way. And that actually would have been sufficient uh, to swing the general election. So uh, the takeaway there is not, uh, you know, if we just had a slightly different trade policy, we'd have a different president. That's an impossible, uh, unknowable thing. Uh, it does say, however, that this particular economic phenomenon did contribute to the shifting political tides and probably was important and will continue to be important going forward. Um, in the, uh, so I was gonna, I'll make one final point and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So the last point I wanna make about this question about is manufacturing different or important? Um, one other thing that makes manufacturing different from other uh, sectors is it is, it is an extremely innovative sector. So in the US, 70% of R&D spending, research and development spending, and about the same share of all patents emanate from manufacturing. Um, so even if you're not concerned about manufacturing as a jobs program, which I think is a reasonable thing to say, well, that's sort of done with, uh, you, you might still be concerned about manufacturing as a part of the kind of industrial, intellectual, and economic base of the country, something that you should care about because going forward, intellectual property and ideas are so much a part of the currency of trade, the currency of the wealth of nations. So uh, in work uh, with Gordon Hansen and David Dorn and also Pian Xu of Harvard Business School, uh, we look at what happens to US patenting. And again, same strategy, we're looking at more and less exposed industries. Uh, and we find, uh, rather startlingly, that industries that become more exposed, we see a reduction in their patent grant rates. Uh, and so it does look like there's actually a reduction in innovative activities in these import competing sectors, possibly because they're just so stressed they have very little free cash uh, to invest in intellectual property. Now I should say, there's work by uh, Nick Bloom, John Van Rienen, Mirko Draca that does a similar exercise, actually before we did it, does an exercise for uh, the EU and reaches a different result. 
So uh, this may not be a general result. It's actually theoretically ambiguous what should happen, and the data support that ambiguity. Um, but uh, uh, I, I feel confident that this is, this is what happened in the United States. OK, so let me wrap up. Uh, so uh, learn, what have we learned? So the first point I want to reemphasize something I said initially. This is not an evaluation of the overall cost benefits of trade. Those benefits are overwhelmingly positive for the you know, global society. The, the gains that have been realized uh, throughout the developing and middle income world are enormous. The costs to the US are small in comparison. Um, and it's very likely that the aggregate benefits to the US are positive, that overall GDP is higher, consumer prices are lower. Many good things have happened. This is really about focusing on the concentrated costs and how large are they. And what we've learned is that the good scenario where workers quickly find reemployment, where the old jobs are about as good as new jobs, where wages are about the same, where uh, employment re quickly uh, re regrows where it was initially shocked, that good scenario does not seem to have come to pass in the last 20 years in the United States. And we've much more seen the bad scenario where the kind of where manufacturing used to stand, we see something more like an economic crater. We don't know why that's true. It may be that the, labor the US labor market was never as fluid as it once was, as we, sorry, as we used to think it was. It could be that basically manufacturing was the last readout of good jobs for not highly educated adults, particularly not highly educated men. It's also the case that China trade was different from other trade because a lot of the north-north trade we've seen in the post-war era, era was trade among rich countries where you know we buy cheese from France, we sell them fighter jets, everybody's happy. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's not a uh, trade where basically we find another country that produces the same stuff much, much more cheaply, which is the first 15 years of China trade. So labor adjustment, so we're kind of in the bad scenario in the sense that not that the aggregate benefits are negative, but the labor market adjustment is slow and costly. Manufacturing employment appears to really have had value to the people who held it. Uh, it's not being replaced by something equally good. And uh, trade shock has definitely affected our politics and in some sense has caused a retreat from globalization. I think economists deserve something of the blame for being so optimistic about the gains from trade that they forgot the, the asterisk, the asterisk that said it can be redistributed, not everyone wins. Maybe you want to think about that you know, before you open up to trade too rapidly. Um, so it certainly reduced our appetite for globalization and put people in power who don't have very mature attitudes uh, about these challenges. Uh, also. Uh, I, I think one can be concerned about not simply about jobs. Manufacturing is never going to be an enormous employer in the US any longer. And it, in fact, it's shrinking throughout the world. Um, a lot of it having to do with automation, not just trade. Um, but uh, innovation and the innovation that comes from that is something we uh, should be a, a policy concern for any advanced nation. Um, so looking forward, uh, as I emphasize, China's rise has been fabulous for global welfare. Uh, for US, it's been a challenge, but there's no going back. Uh, uh, the China shock, in some sense, accelerated the inevitable. Right? 30 years from now, the, there's no way the US would have been producing shoes and commodity furniture independent of China. It's also not likely to recur. China has developed. It faces many of the same bottlenecks that other countries do about rising labor costs, uh, pollution, congestion, and so on. Um, so even with no change in policy, the next 20 years would not look like the last. Hopefully, other nations will develop rapidly. Uh, large nations like Brazil, uh, like India, large matters in trade. Size matters. I want all nations to develop, but uh, it's, more, it's more shocking if they're large. Um, what, the, what the trade shock has done is uh, laid bare the labor market challenges that the United States faces, uh, declining labor force participation and earnings of non-college adults, uh, last, lost appetite for globalization. Um, I think you know, policymakers. Uh, uh, you know, leaning on economists were too sanguine about the free trade uh, is a free lunch uh, story. Uh, economists have always known better. The data didn't suggest that the caveat was needed. Turns out it is in circum cer certain circumstances. As a result, because we believed that there were no likely to be no costs, we were certainly not at all prepared for what actually came about. Um, an open question is, where will the next big labor market shock, shock come from? It could come from trade shocks, but it could also emanate from automation. Uh, certainly over the longer run, automation has a bit, been a bigger deal. It's a larger part of the fall in US manufacturing employment since 1943, certainly. Uh, and, uh, and the concern is it might happen really fast. We don't really know. I don't know. Um, the follow-up question is, uh, can we better, be, be better prepared next time 
to help workers adjust successfully to the type of changes uh, that they may be facing? And the answer to that is, I hope so. <laughs> um, OK, well, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, David. That was, that was a kind of, to me, a brilliant example of political economy, even if we're arguing about whether David Ricardo really did come from Portugal. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. Um, I was fascinated by um, you looking at trade shocks. And, and of course, here we're kind of obsessed with Brexit. And we're thinking about this as a trade shock. And some of the proponents of Brexit will say, Actually, we're in this very protectionist block on agriculture. Let's take that as a simple example. And we're going to move to zero tariffs with, with the rest of the world, and, and this is going to be great. Um, what, what are the lessons for us with a, a, about to hit a trade shot, which will change our trade patterns? How do we make sure that we don't get the adverse consequences? Yeah, I, I think that the adverse consequences primarily have to do with the, dis the disruption. Right, the reallocation. So you're not going to get disruption, obviously, if a sector expands. Right? So if your tariffs come down and you start exporting more of that, it's, again, I don't want to make a mercantilist point that it's good to export bad to import. But simply, it's when, you, when you start importing something you were domestically producing, you're going to have to, workers are going to have to change sectors. And that's costly. If you expand something and export more of it, you'll just suck workers in. They'll be fine with that. Um, so I think that's the, uh, the, the any movement from a steady state is going to uh, create challenges. You know, I mean, an example, you know, Germany is a country that has been on very much the, uh, in the benefiting column of China's rise. And because they found a great market for many high-end uh, luxury goods, uh, uh, aided by the artificially low euro. Uh, and, um, and so it has been expansionary in many ways. So I, I think that the concern, uh, or let me put it another way. Uh, if I could go back and relive the 2000s and I had power, which I don't now and didn't then, uh, I would not try to stop China's accession to the WTO or the trade integration that occurred, but I would have wanted to slow its pace. And that's not at all unprecedented in trade agreements. Like I mentioned earlier, the multi-fiber agreement, that had been in place for decades. It needed to go, but it wasn't shut off overnight. It was actually phased out over a number of waves to minimize the, you know, the kind of scarring. And, and it matters, even for the same adjustment, how fast you make it, because there's a natural ebb and flow. People uh, age and retire out of work. They move sectors. Young people don't enter declining occupations, uh, declining industries. So if it happens slowly, a lot of it occurs through natural attrition. If it happens overnight, uh, that's going to leave scars. So I guess the, the, the question is, uh, what, what sectors are going to have to you know, contract very rapidly? And what are the outside opportunities for the workers who are going to lose employment in that case? And what are the set of supports that allow them to maintain a decent standard of living, assist them with liquidity while they search for work, potentially give them skills training, and ensure their families uh, that their children don't bear the brunt uh, uh, in their own human capital development uh, due to that disruption? And I, so I infer from that that means long transitional phase, don't go out without any deal at all. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just one, one final point, and then I'll throw it open to everybody else. It's quite clear, as you said, overall winners, but concentrated losers. Right. Are there any lessons about how you grab some of the money back from the winners to help compensate the losers? Yeah, uh, yeah so it's, it's, it's really tough, because every economic textbook will tell you, well, the GDP grows, so it must be possible to compensate the losers and tax the winners and still have everyone be at least as well off. And that some people... Are, that that's right. He was right. Portuguese uh, or Italian. Uh, that's Italian. right. Uh, but the fact that it's possible doesn't mean it will occur. In fact, I don't know of any case where it's happened. Uh, and um, I think the... Uh, and and that's, that's a, I should say, and that's a good scenario because uh, that's only income. And for many people, you know, for all of us, uh, employment is, isn't exclusively about income. It's about identity. You know, your job is, is a role in society, it's a social circle, it's a reason to get up in the morning, it's a set of skills and responsibilities that you value. So there's no way to really make people whole, but it does matter a lot what the outside options were, are. In the 1990s, the U.S. also lost a fair amount of manufacturing employment due to China's rise, but no one was complaining about it, partly because our labor markets were so tight, 
uh, productivity and wages were rising. Everyone was moving onto the internet. They all were buying homes in the cloud. Uh, so uh, it, uh, you know, I think the outside option was much more favorable. So it, it matters what is the economic backdrop. And I think people who lost employment in the US in the 2000s were kind of falling into quicksand. Uh, it was very difficult for them to emerge from it. Okay, thank you very much. Now, questions, please. We've got microphones there. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm one over there next. Um, you just touched upon automation at the end, but it seems to me that it's also a, a big story over the last 10, 15 years. For example, if you look at coal mining, which has become very fashionable again in the US, uh, you know, you've been having a very large increases in output at the same time as uh, very uh, large drops in, uh, in employment. We don't have to get into technicalities how you want split up one from the other, but perhaps you could go a little bit more into what role automation has been, uh, has been playing and to what extent you can really uh, attribute all this redistribution just to, just to trade. Sure. So uh, automation has been extremely important or in the post-war period. If you ask me even since 1980 to the present, what has been like more numerically important in terms of manufacturing employment, automation, or trade, I would say automation. If you ask me since the year 2000, I would say trade. Automation doesn't tend to move in these huge discrete changes. And it's certainly not actually very concentrated in the sectors in which we lost employment. The reason those are labor intensive is because they're actually really difficult to automate. It's much easier to have robotics in automobile production than it is to have them in textile work because textiles are soft and inconsistent, right? The great automation technology for textiles is starch. You take cloth, you put enough starch on it, and it becomes like cardboard, and then a machine can work with it. So, the, um, so that's why these are labor intensive sectors. Um, so I, although automation will be very important going forward, the big kind of you know, falling off a cliff incident that we see is probably not due to automation. However, uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about these the same way. There's no, there's, I, people give a moral significance to job loss to due to trade that they don't give to job loss due to automation, but I don't think that's justified. They're, bo they're, you know, they're, they're both equally, why, you know, if I lose my job, the identity of the, of the machine or person who took it is not so interesting to me. Uh, so I think we should be thinking very hard about what are the set of programs uh, that allow people to adapt successfully. Uh, and that, so the, I think the lesson from the China shock applies equally well to the lesson from the forthcoming you know, robot shock or the robocalypse, if you will. Uh, that's the robotic apocalypse uh, that people talk about all the time. I actually don't think we're on the verge of that, but we should be prepared uh, for a similar set of challenges. Thank you. Gentleman over there. Is there a comparable period of what's happened from, sorry, from an economic history point of view, is there a comparable period of what's happening in the US today that has happened previously? If yes, could you give an example? And if no, does this imply that there's a stagnation in technological progress, or even if there is technological progress that is unable to absorb the losses the employment losses that, ex that is being experienced in the manufacturing sector. Sure, okay. let me make sure I understand the question. Um, the, are you asking is there a comparable trade shock or is there a comparable dysfunction following a shock? Comparable dysfunction uh. following a shock. <laughs> uh, you know, I actually don't think, I don't think it's unprecedented. You all know of, of areas, places, locations where you, know, you have some seismic shift and the places just go into decline. Right, you know, uh, Manchester, for example, or many cities in the United States. Uh, or there's recent work uh, by Brian Kovac and Rafael Dix Carniero about Brazil and the trade liberalization that occurred there uh, in the uh, early 1990s. And you actually see regions that ha they have these big tariff cuts, so the prices, they, they all of a sudden they're much more exposed. And over the first few years, you know, employment goes down, wages go down, and you think, okay, then they'll, they'll stabilize. It takes 20 years for them to stabilize, and they stabilize at a much lower level. So we don't really understand why this is so, but there's a lot of you know, geographically concentrated economic shocks tend to actually have very durable impacts. It takes a long time for places to rebuild themselves. And when they do, it's often a different group of people who are benefiting. So many of the US cities that have gone decline and then have since rebounded have gone from manufacturing to hospitals and education. And that's a, you know, they're fine places to live, but it's not the same, it's not steel workers who are you know, teaching at the universities. So, um, I, I think what, you know, what maybe distinguishes this period is, yes, economic growth has been very slow, so people are not being quickly reabsorbed. Two, 
the labor market for non-college adults in the U.S. and throughout much of the rich world uh, has been, you know, the floor has been falling for more than three decades. This is just kind of another kick in the teeth for that. Uh, but it's closer to, the, the, you know, there was a refuge in construction, maybe there's a refuge in vehicle driving, there's a refuge in manufacturing, there are just fewer and fewer safe harbors. So uh, that may also be what made it particularly uh, difficult for people to bounce back. Can, can I also point out at this point that you are not an audience of steelmakers, so I'm about to ask another gentleman to ask a question, and I think from a gender diversity point of view, it'd be quite nice if uh, that changed. Sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Gus, and thank you, David. Um, I, I was going to sort of make the point that it seemed that your slides seem to show that China has been fantastic for uh, women's equality in the US, unless your name's Hillary Clinton. Um, but I, I wanted to actually ask you to, do, to, to paint a counterfactual of what would the US look like today? Can you describe it uh, had China not entered the WTO? Uh, sure, uh, <laughs> large North American, no, the, uh, it, it would, I mean, I think it would be uh, on, the, on the downside, uh, consumer prices would be higher, uh, there would be less diversity of products, electronics would cost more, automobiles would cost more, um, there, uh, so there, there are uh, many ways in which, you know, the average American would be less affluent today were it not for China's entry in the WTO. I would say the um, downsides are uh, a substantial loss of manufacturing throughout the uh, South Atlantic and the attended social decay that's come with that. Uh, perhaps lasting damage to our politics and the rest of the world uh, through our politics. Um, and, uh, and then uh, a greater concern for, I think, is looking forward is whether the U.S. has gone on kind of a, a long-term maladaptive response of uh, instead of investing in its people, investing in its innovation, kind of, you know, closing borders, cutting uh, expenditure, becoming a kind of a cooler, less forward-looking place, uh, that would be a real concern. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think the, again, the, I don't think the short-term direct economic consequences of the U.S. are huge in an accounting sense. I just think they're very concentrated. Um, I think the benefits are diffuse, they're significant. I think the, the political carnage is probably the most significant long-term cost. It, to the degree, it, it shapes the direction of the U.S. and unfortunately the rest of the world along with it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Hi, is there anything that you have China shocked and not found an effect where you were expecting one? She's referring to the fact that I have like a cottage industry of China shock papers, you know. <laughs> uh, have we not found it? Let's see. Um, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the failed This part. is where we Wait. need the Journal of Negative Results, right, right. you know. Well, we actually, we've been trying for years to, find, to look for a, a, a um, geographic mobility effect and actually been trying to use the geographic mobility changes to estimate the sort of incidents, and they actually have a project with uh, Arno Kostano and Dave Connell Donaldson uh, looking at that, and a student um, uh, named Aisha Bendia. And uh, so far, we found no effect on uh, geographical mobility of people in shock locations, uh, which is, uh, uh, doesn't seem consistent with sort of first principles. So we haven't given up. We're, we're still trying to shocking that, hoping uh, if we shock it hard enough, it'll move. <laughs> Uh, it seems to me that much of what you're talking about uh, 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 points to a real problem with the way we conceptualize economics, uh, where we're still dealing with labor as a commodity and we're measuring the losses in terms of GDP foregone, and yet you've been talking about economic costs, which result from economic insecurity, deprivation that, that happens at the low end. I'm wondering if maybe one of the reasons we're finding it difficult to deal with this is our conceptualization is too limited. In other words, I think you're pointing, the work you're doing is pointing to a need to reconceptualize some of these things. <laughs> 
I just add to that as well? Because some of the China stuff, you pointed to the great income gains. And yeah. when, if you measure this in terms of subjective well-being, you don't get quite, this, quite such great results. Same kind of point, really. Well, we haven't China shocked that one, but Sorry. we should, <laughs> to your point. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I don't want to sound like a kind of an untrained sociologist. Uh, the, um, I, I, I think it's, it's undeniable that there are, uh, you know, that the costs of, of job loss are not just pecuniary. And uh, we know that we see that in elevated mortality uh, among job losers, we see all kinds of misery. I think the, the uh, evidence we have on, uh, on drug abuse also consistent with that. Um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to know how to exactly tally and reconcile that. I don't, you know, certainly one response to say, well, we should just have stasis and then, you know, no one loses their job. But of course, we know that that's a, an, un, an unpalatable idea, not just from a you know, a selfish perspective, but from a, a glo from a societal perspective, we need progress. Uh, we need innovation, and innovation is intrinsically disruptive. Uh, you know, e there are e people in the U.S. now talking about you know we ought to apply that kind of reasoning to automation. So Bill Gates has famously said we ought to be taxing robots. I, I personally think that's a horrendous idea um, because I you know I think we we. We need to try to realize the gains that come through reallocation, uh, but we need to, at the same time as a compassionate society, recognize. Yeah. You know, okay. I'm also right. talking about long-term, even economic sure. capacity. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well. For instance, okay. If you disrupt families. They're sure. not very good platforms right. for raising their children. <laughs> and if you increase child poverty. Sure. Well, I, I'm 100% with you there. That's, uh, I mean, I, I very much worry that you know you can have economic dynamism in one generation that gives rise to dynasticism in another if you make inequality of childhood of household circumstances too unequal. Right? You prevent mobility. So I, I think what that's a completely that's a completely legitimate concern, and that's sort of what a tax and social safety net system should do: is is take the edge off those things so that the you know the misfortunes of the parents aren't visited too heavily on the children. That's so. That's the social policy side. There's also the industrial policy side. I mean, you know, it was Paul Krugman who formalized the argument about why you would actually protect industries because they have economies of scale and you need to get them to a certain size before they can, uh, you know, succeed. And if you let them shrink too much, they will go away. And I, I think one can have a concern about the sort of industrial and innovative base of countries that lose too much of that capacity too quickly. So um, I had a question at the beginning of the lecture. You mentioned um, that one of the things we haven't seen during this shock is that people moved sort of for their job mobility or moved to the places where the jobs were. So just now you mentioned that it wasn't actually much of a factor, so maybe this isn't quite right. But I was wondering to what extent it's different this time that the places where job growth is, so I guess mostly on the coast and places like the Bay Area and New York, that it has now become quite impossible for people to move there because the jobs and the living costs there they just don't match quite what people are so think, and what that's going to do for sort of long-term geographic uh, inequality in the U.S. And if you yeah, this, is, uh, this is a really important point. This, you know, Enrico Moretti has written on this extensively that the economic geography of the U.S. has become also incredibly unequal, and that so much more of the of the glo of the national wealth is on the coasts or in Texas, basically, uh, in very few places. And so there really aren't that many good places, uh, and those places are very expensive. So it's not obvious where displaced textile workers should be going, and it's not clear that you know Palo Alto is the best location for them. So uh, I agree, and in fact, there's been a dramatic decline in geographic mobility in the United States uh, over the last 20 years. We don't really know why, um, but yeah, it may be that there was a, a more robust mobility response, and maybe the reason there isn't more of one is uh, one, the places that you would go are farther flung and quite expensive, and two, it's not clear they really have a, an opening. Uh, for this individual. So I, I, I agree with the concern that you highlight. Um, it's a follow-up question in a way. One of the other areas where economists haven't uh, paid so much in, enough attention in the past is actually the, the geography of the economy and that things happen in particular places. Mm. Once upon a time I would have said it is much more important to help people and not think about the places. But um, I'm just wondering if there's a political economy argument for turning it around. And you said it's never the case that 
the winners are taxed and the losers are compensated. But might it be easier to do so if you think about it in terms of places? And if there is a particular town or city that's struck by one of these shocks, it's actually politically easier to say, we'll compensate the place, we'll do some extra investment there? Yeah, the, uh, I agree with the point you're making that uh, this, this sort of set of events has reinvigorated economic interests in the sort of economics of place. And there's a couple of sort of bodies of work. So that I mentioned Enrico Moretti and also uh, Pat Klein at UC Berkeley, and they've been sort of looking at place-based policies. So, you know, the kind of like the Tennessee Valley Authority in the United States that made these huge investments in manufacturing, uh, different, you know, empowerment zones. So that's one line of thinking that you could just put, make the right investments in places and help them to rebound. There's also other work by uh, Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren uh, that says like, which places are bad for kids, and let's think about getting them out of there. And so trying to ask of the effect of places on people, and uh, can you move them around? I think there are obviously issues with moving people out of bad places, because you're not going to move everyone, and then the people who are left behind are presumably worse off. So I think we know very little about how to reverse the trajectory of places in decline. We watch it happen all the time. Uh, you know, sort of textbook models would say we should have reconvergence quickly. People, you know, resources should flow in. That doesn't happen. They take a long time to find equilibrium, and lots of bad stuff happens in the interim. Um, so I 100% uh, on the idea of fixing places, but I, I think our sort of knowledge about how to do that successfully is, is pretty, is pretty uh, limited. So. Um, Professor Martin Weitzman of the MIT wrote a book on the share economy arguing that if wages were related to the profitability of the enterprise, then in a time of declining profitability, um, simply the wages going down would preserve the number of jobs. Uh, that was taken by uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, and in, who introduced profit-related pay, making it tax-free to, to give a kickstart to the system. It didn't actually work, and we had declines and jobs were lost. However, in the last 10 years, what we have seen is that employment in the UK has remained remarkably constant and indeed has grown, and yet at the same time, wages in real terms are declining. So the concept of the share economy, whereby jobs can be preserved um, at the expense of the income that's taken by the labor share, does appear to be work. However, we then have the criticism of very, very poor uh, productivity levels. Is it better to lose the jobs and have high productivity, or should we keep the jobs and suffer uh, by being a very low productivity economy? France versus the UK. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, it's interesting that you make that point because there, there used to be, there were, you know, kind of 15 years ago, there was a thing called, the idea called the Krugman conjecture, uh, which said you can take your inequality in one of two forms, either very unequal wages or low levels of employment among low educated workers. It didn't actually bear out in the data. There did not seem to be a trade-off between inequality and employment. Um, the experience of the UK is really positive in the sense that employment has held constant and grown despite falling wages. In the US, we actually see falling wages and falling employment. And the groups that have seen the largest falls in sort of offer wages or wages in the market have seen the largest declines in employment. So we seem to be at a point where you know, uh, we're on kind of a labor supply curve and wages are falling and people are choosing not to work. So I don't, you know, I wish the answer were, you know, allow wages to fall a bit and people will re-enter the labor market. But at least in the United States, we don't even appear to be within the realm where that's a, a feasible policy or where that policy would be effective. So I don't know the answer. I mean, Germany is another country that's had big falls in wages at the bottom, but has maintained pretty robust employment. So that's, so it seems like falling wages is the good scenario, <laughs> unfortunately. So I don't know, I, I, uh, I don't, uh, at this point in the US, I actually think higher wages would be the key to uh, raising employment. Okay, so gentlemen there, the penultimate question, and then you can have the last one. So, so thanks very much for that. I, I had a, a question about policy prescriptions. Um, so I think I heard you say one would be to slow down China's accession to the WTO, but of course, I mean, that would protect US workers, but it would slow down Chinese workers move out of poverty, you know. So I would, I would genuinely question whether that's a legitimate prescription. The, but it, but I think the policy prescriptions question is interesting. I mean, you've mentioned kind of area-based policy prescriptions. Are there, you know, are, are there other programs that you've seen that you think have merit 
that, that could be targeted on workers in certain sectors having access to large retraining grants or well, what's the long list of, of policy options? Sure. So what, uh, I agree with you that the sort of the, the net social case for, sl for having, had, had we counterfactually been able to slow down China's succession to WTO would have been a negative for humanity in some sense. But of course, voters don't vote for humanity. They vote for their own countries. And I don't expect you know, voters in every country to vote for the world welfareist party. They're going to vote for uh, self-interest. So it wouldn't be unprecedented for one to say, OK, we're going to make this adjustment, but we're going to make it more slowly. But uh, leave that aside. That's, that's not within the realm of possibility. Um, the, uh, in terms of things that would work or could benefit, first of all, there, there, is no, there is no magic bullet. There's no way to make people whole completely. There's a grab bag of social policies that are a good idea. Uh, one wouldn't be making trade adjustment assistance to the US more generous, more accessible, and not tied to staying in school. Maybe you could just allow people to take a new job at a lower wage and temporarily uh, support the wage difference, You know, uh, make up some of the lost earnings. A second policy in the US would be uh, to expand the earned income tax credit. That's one of our effective policies that has uh, raised employment rates among people with low earnings capacity. However, it's targeted on adults with dependent children. Most people who are going to qualify for it are women with dependent children. Uh, many of the men presumably are fathers of those children, but they can't claim them as dependents because they're not married to uh, the mothers. And consequently, they don't qualify for the benefit. Uh, I, one can make a case for wanting to transfer benefits to families with children. However, the biggest labor market problem we have in the United States is falling employment rates of, of non-college adults. So a wage subsidy might be a good idea there. Another idea I would say, and this is, this is much more radical, but uh, a change in tax policy. The US, US tax policy is incredibly antiquated and very much is uh, punitive towards uh, domestic production and does not treat uh, imports and domestically produced goods symmetrically. We don't have a value-added taxation system. Uh, so there's a lot of incentive to not produce stuff in the US and to, and to keep your money overseas after you do produce it, wherever you produce it. So tax reform, corporate tax reform, would actually be a good idea and it could be used to offset payroll taxes. I even you know, somewhat heretically supported the, the so-called border adjustment policy that was for a while floated uh, by the Trump administration before being taken out back and killed. <laughs> OK, question there. <coughs> The last, yeah. sorry, the last question sort of touched on it, but on, you mentioned skills retraining as one of the adjustment mechanisms. Are there any specific lessons to be learned from what happened in the US, maybe at federal or state level, as to what could have done better, what, what could have gone better, especially also in the Brexit context here? Yeah, I, I think there's, you know, there's often this desire to take mid-career adults and say, oh, you know, you could be a computer programmer, you could be a, uh, you could be a nurse, and so on. Um, and that may work, but you're asking people to make a very extensive transition uh, in, in all aspects of their lives, not just like what they know, but the type of work that they do. And, um, there's actually a lot in, in most industrialized countries, there's a lot of skilled vocational work uh, that isn't particularly manufacturing, but might be in the trades, might be in skilled repair, even sometimes moving into more higher end manufacturing, which generally is much more skill intensive, but still tends to be, stick around because, specifically because it's skill intensive. So I think their, their targeted retraining uh, can be done effectively, but you have to figure out what is appropriate. And the answer to that typically is going to be very specific to a geographic region. I mean, where this is done successfully in the US, it's often done by the community colleges uh, in concert with industry. Uh, so it's, you know, the federal government sometimes supports it, but it's often, you know, so uh, uh, Tennessee has a very effective technical training program. Um, so I think there, uh, there's, it's got to be a heterogeneous solution, but one should not think that uh, you know, the objective is to get everyone into college regardless of their age or to get them all you know, working in the health services. Uh, there are jobs that are conceptually closer to manufacturing, where skills are likely to be more transferable, where people may have aptitudes and interests, um, and uh, making good investments and, and helping people figure that out. One problem we have in the US is it's just a wild west of uh, for-profit and not-for-profit education, and people have a, really a lot of trouble figuring out what's a wise investment and what's a scam. So uh, guiding them through that process would also be beneficial. Thank you, David. Well, I, said, I said we'd finish uh, at 8 o'clock. So I think what David has shown is one of those gains from trade. You know, I would love to import him and hire him in the department for exiting the European <laughs> Union and have <laughs> David Davis sit down and listen to all of that about trade adjustment. Uh, and Liam Fox. on Saturday. Yep. <laughs>
<laughs> so that'll be good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. I think we'll have drinks afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.